Hello and welcome to another episode of Releasing Your Inner Dragon with Drake and Marie. I am one of your hosts, Maxwell Alexander Drake. I'm an award-winning novelist. I teach writing over the world. As always with me is my other host, Marie. Hi, my name is Marie Mullaney. I am a fantasy author and I run a YouTube channel about fantasy world building. And today we're going to be uh, going against another brave soul who sent us something for us to critique. Uh, but before we get in there, the normal, usual jargon, please help us by liking this so that the algorithms will pick us up. Make sure you share it with your writing communities. Make sure you subscribe so you know when episodes are dropping. Do all that stuff that you're supposed to do to help us out. We don't ask for much and we give a lot. So Throw, throw a little love our way. All right. So All right. jumping right into it. Uh, actually, before we get into that, before before we get into it, we do have a few things that, that we want to talk about. So first of all, Yay. I have copies of <laughs> the new book that me and Marie co-wrote, Magic Fall. So if you're on YouTube, you can actually see the cover. If you're not, it's a wonderful looking cover. I'm not going to describe it. Floating city in the background, two people standing, looking at each other. Um, but these are up. You can pre-order the the ebook only on Amazon. They don't allow us to throw up pre-orders on for the physical copies for some reason. I don't know why. I don't know what the difference is in pre-ordering ebooks versus pre-ordering physical copies. But it is also available on Starving Writer Studio for pre-order. Um, and the nice thing about going to Starving Writer Studio is you will be getting it autographed by both me and Marie. Because these are in my warehouse here in Las Vegas. And Marie will be in my warehouse in Las Vegas in just a few days from us yeah. recording this. So um, if you would like to get autographed copies of it and you're not going to be at Comic-Con where you can actually see both of us, then that's the way to do it. Now, we are only doing paperback in this version. Um, hardbacks are very expensive. And to order a massive stock of them to stock in my warehouse is not going to happen. There will be a hardback available. Uh, unfortunately, it will just be available from Amazon so, um, you know, you'll have to fly to both Vegas and Finland or wait until the next time we're both together uh, to get both of us to sign it. But do have that. That book has uh, illustrations inside. Oh, yes, it does. Um, let me just pull up one. There's one right there. Um, Check so that out. <laughs> there is there's probably what about 10 or 12 illustrations in here? Yeah. Somewhere around in there. Maybe a few more, maybe a few less. Uh, some really cool stuff. So, Sorry. yep, some really cool stuff in here. It's a great story. You have a good time with it. Um, a lot of fun. Very excited about it. Loved holding it in my grubby little hands. Marie hasn't even touched this yet because they they're not available in Finland, <laughs> at least this moment. Um, and then on a personal note, the first new novella for the eight novella prequels of The Realm of the Dying Sun is out. This will also be at Comic-Con. This is also available. Now, this is just available on Amazon. Um, it's only going to be available in, in paperback because it's just a novella. Um, but ebook and paperback on Amazon. And then, of course, you can get an autographed copy if you get it from Starving Writer Studio, uh, which is always where you want to be because if you want to support us artists, obviously ordering directly from us as opposed to giving Amazon a cut of it is going to be advantageous to us. Um, but we're going to be dropping, we have eight of these novellas. They will be dropping about every six to eight weeks over the next uh, 14 months uh, in anticipation for the 20 novel actual saga to start dropping. So the first one is there and done and ready, and it does not have interior art, um, <laughs> but good looking little cover and and just a lot of fun. And this is a fantastic story. I'm really, really proud of it. And then lastly, I've been talking about it. This is not available anywhere. Um, actually, I sold some last night at my local class, and I've got a local class tonight, so I'll sell a couple of them there. Um, hopefully, it'll be up this week, but this is the ultimate guide to show, don't tell. This is my, if I was if I was working on a PhD in, in creative writing, this would be my thesis on how to write like me, how to write in a very emotional, very immersive, very engaging way. This is literally the ultimate guide to show, don't tell. Um, it is fantastic. It's a fun read. Uh, as always, I write my creative writing books to be very enjoyable to read. They always have a gimmick. In this one, I am a wizard, and you are my apprentice, and I am teaching you to cast the spell of Shodotel. And so it's a lot of fun. Um, some over-the-top language in here as far as like 
a lot of my favorite readers were like, wow, this is like reading a 1950s fantasy voiceover uh, movie, but in a really good way. Um, so it's a lot of fun. And you, if you read any of my brutal writing advice, you know, they're all silly and, and have a lot of kind of humor in them. So, but this will make you an absolutely amazing immersive writer. I highly recommend that you pick these up as soon as they're available. Um, these will be available through drakeu.com, not starvingwriterstudio.com. Uh, and then, of course, they'll be up on Amazon. So hopefully by the end of this week, we'll have these up. That's This one is kind of not in my hands because I have a business partner who handles all the, the Drake U stuff. So that is in the works. But these are in the warehouse. So I do have, uh, I think I got a thousand copies that were sent into my warehouse, uh, which will last me a couple months, maybe at most. <laughs> but... um. So yeah, so three new books as promised uh, for Comic Con San Diego. Somehow we accomplished it. That's it. That's that's my announcements as far as that is concerned. Uh, so yep. I'm going to turn it over to Marie. Let her share her screen. If you're on YouTube, you can watch us actually, you know, and read along with us. If you're on a podcast, just listen, and we'll try to be as thorough as we can with our descriptions. Right. So, uh, as always, we have changed character names, and uh, I will just get going with reading this. <clears throat> Once upon a time, John told his mother that he wouldn't live to see 40. Like a true warrior, he would be cut down by a sword on the battlefield, struck by an arrow, or turned into pieces of minced meat in an explosion of oil, metal, and gunpowder. He would scream in universal fear, even though he wouldn't want to admit it to himself. However, sometimes he would try to please her with the idea that he would be poisoned. He imagined that, for that occasion, his poisoners would order specially crafted teapots. They would be a real treasure, and he had no doubt that they would be made by artists from the distant cliffs of the emperor's cloud. He envisioned the moment when he would laugh in their faces, knowing he was eternal, his name eternal his legacy eternal. After all, individuals always perish at the hands of the defeated, and who can be more defeated than those tyrants in power? Wasn't that a valid line of thought? His mother would almost always dismiss it with a half smile, saying he was wasting his time on nonsense. She would look at him through a small window concealed by wooden grills. Since then, a lot of time has passed. He hasn't seen that little window for decades, his mother's face even longer. In his memories, her round, smiling face will forever remain colored by the scent of withered flowers. Okay, I'm going to stop there because I think we have quite a lot to say. So I don't say this often, but this is crying out for first person. This whole introductory paragraph would read better in first person. Maybe. I mean, it's 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 omniscient. And so mm -hmm. whether you're going to write it in first person omniscient or third person omniscient, it really doesn't matter. Um, so I want to preface by saying it's actually interesting and engaging. Um, mm -hmm. There is a there is a almost a tongue in cheekness to it of of the glorification of one's own death, um, which shows either a, a society with an ingrained, insane ideology of self-sacrifice or just this individual being absolutely insane. Hmm. Uh, either way, that's interesting. And that is a hook. And we talk about this all the time about the hook. So this is a hook that makes you go, oh, this is interesting. Let me find out what's going on. It is still omniscient, though. And also, it's a lot of information about a character that I don't care about yet. And so it's not as impactful, in my opinion, as it could be if I learned all of this information later more organically, as opposed to just being puked onto me right up at the beginning so that's why i say i think it would read better in first person remember when we did that first person episode and we spoke about 
how omnis, a first person omniscient is often used as an introductory mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. thing. Like like yours, you know, I am Sasha, I'm an angel, that's false, not, you know, blah, blah, like that, that kind of thing. Right, right. That, this mm-hmm. to me, feels like that kind of introductory paragraph. And I agree now, with that. It works really well in first person, right? Because you know that you it's a it's a first person narrator telling you what's happened to them, making it immediately engaging, right? Because you're finding out about the person who's going to tell you the story or through who you will experience the story. Mm-hmm. And that's what that's what makes that kind of introduction, that kind of first person omniscient thing engaging. The problem with third person omniscient is that it is removed and you don't know who the narrator is. Right. So it's like the universe is just info dumping this on you as opposed to a person, you know, telling you, as opposed to the character telling you this. 100%. Um, Yes. And and we talked about that, you know, in the first person, but you're 100% right. With that, um, you know, the once upon a time, obviously, I would never do that i i don't agree with it i think it's a horrible way to start off a story a lot of people are probably going to be turned off like right there and put the book down without even going any further um but you are correct if the beginning of this was written in first person you get that immediate connection you know i once told my mother and i wouldn't live to see 40 Mm. you know there's just something engaging about that now the problem i have is that you then can't switch you can't then come down here to the next section and switch into third person because that will be too jarring and it'll be like wait a minute where did that guy go what is this story now and i'm just a very big proponent against mixing first and third person it doesn't work as well as you think it works so So i hear you i you can i mean king killer king killer does Right. Yeah. I mean, you can do stuff. you can do it. Sure, you can do it, but it it does take a lot of setup, mm-hmm. right? Which because what you would have. what you would then need to obviously do is say like, let me walk with me and experience my tale or something like that, and then have a a clear scene break where you then go into, you know, the the actual thing. But, but you could still. also do the. I think like I don't know if this is a multi POV. Um, story you know maybe it's a single pov and it's actually easy just to write this first person yeah we don't we know obviously only have one I, chapter so well <laughs> and i'm even i'm even more behind than you because because of my sickness and all of that this week i'm literally walking into this and now i've read one you know par- one paragraph of the story <laughs> so far today so i yeah. literally have no idea what's coming next um yeah. and yes i hear you with that but but here's the thing even when you do that Remember, point of view is the illusion that you create that wraps around the reader so that they understand how they're going to experience the story. So when you start a, an illusion bubble of first person and you allow them to get comfortable in that, especially if you do a good job, because there's some really good hooky things in here, like that opening line, if it said instead... I once told my mother that I wouldn't live to see 40. Like, that's a very, it's like, well, why would you tell your mother that? What, what the hell is going on here? Hmm. And it, and also there's some things in here. Again, we talked about this with first person too. The most important thing about first person is to create an engaging voice. Hmm. So if you create, if, if this is written correctly and it has a very engaging voice, hmm. that's where the disconnect comes in because now you've created this beautiful illusion, this very comfortable shell that I'm going to write in of this voice that I've fallen in love with in one paragraph. And then you're going to ruthlessly rip that away and stick me into a different bubble, a different vehicle that I'm now going to have to get used to. I just, you know, you set me in this thing. I adjusted my seat. I've, I've adjusted the rear view mirror. Everything's really comfortable. And then all of a sudden you put me in a different car and I'm like, well, well, now I got to do all that over again. Hmm. And so, Yes, people do it. Yes, it can work. But no, it will never work flawlessly. There will always be that moment for the reader where they have to adjust from one vehicle to the next. It can never happen perfectly. It has never been done perfectly because you can't. It's impossible. You're moving to another vehicle. You can do it really well to limit the impact of it, but the impact is still there. 
And then again, that comes down to the question that me and you have talked about many, many, many times, which is asking yourself why you're doing this. Does switching from first person, you know, let's say we did open this in first person and we switched to third, does that actually improve the reader's experience through the story? Not just because we can do it. So, mm-hmm. you know, I love Pat Patrick Rothfuss. I love, you know, the name of the wind, but I still the weakest part of that was for me was switching from first to third person and not because he didn't do it well he did it well not because he didn't have a reason for it i just don't agree that the reason improved the journey for the audience Hmm. i i don't think it made any difference i don't think that that story would have been any more or less impactful if it was all written in first if it was all written in third or if it was written in the first third hybrid that he did and that's where i have a problem with it if it doesn't actually improve the story if it doesn't actually have a massive impact that makes me go oh yeah you know doing it this way absolutely needs to happen because of all this amazing stuff that it brings to the table which way outweighs Mm -hmm. the 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 problem of switching your audience having to switch vehicles between first and third so 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 the reason why, like, and I'm not saying this, this, I don't, I'm not saying this author should switch. Um, I, I actually right. think that they should do this whole thing in first person because the the voice is very strong in this piece. There's a very strong voice here, but um, but the the reason why I thought that they could potentially switch is because they already have a tense switch here. So right. up here we're it. doing John told his mother da 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 da, then here. Since then, a lot of time has passed. Check that switch to first, but the first, first uh, to to um, present tense. To present tense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was actually going to comment on that, which that is yeah. also to me a big no no. Yeah. Um, because tense is also another part of that vehicle. Uh, it's not as, it's not as hefty as the whole vehicle itself. But you've definitely moved me from the driver's seat to the passenger seat. Hmm. And so now I've got to get used to that. And and that's really what I try to explain. That's really what it is. When you do this stuff as an author, when you switch from first to third, when you switch from present to past uh, or past to present, whatever, you're forcing the reader out of something that they just got comfortable with into something else. And yes, they can get comfortable with that too, but they have to make that that adjustment why i don't want my readers thinking about the seat that they're sitting in i want them thinking about the ride they're on and so once i get them into that seat i'm going to keep them there and they're never going to think about that seat ever again they're now just all into the ride and you know it's it's odd like reading this i've i've had a few people say things like well this is an ongoing thing, right? So it should be in present tense when you when you when you have something that you're writing a story in first person past tense, let's say. And they're like, okay, but this is an ongoing thing. It should just be in present tense. I'm like, mm, no, you're welcome to your opinion, but no. Yeah. <laughs> like- <laughs> present tense reading is awkward. Hearing it, it's not awkward because we hear present tense stories all the time. But reading it we consume past tense stories better than we consume which is why there's a large portion of the readership population that won't even read present tense so and we've I, talked about that yeah i know there are plenty of people who will read present tense stories but i for mm-hmm. example not one of them if right I, I, unless i'm actually critiquing a, a work or something like that if i pick up a book and it's in first if it's in and it's in present tense unless it's susan collins level of of gripping Good luck getting me to read it, you know. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, <even I> mean, <laughs> and it's gotten better. We're we're probably down, and of course, these are these are me just guessing based off of anecdotal. I'm talking to people as I travel the world, and I do meet about twenty thousand readers every year as I do my you know convention tours and everything. So this is anecdotal, but I think it's so. Fifteen years ago, it was probably close to thirty thirty five percent of people who refused to read first person present tense. It's probably down to twenty twenty five percent, but since getting a reader to read your stuff is the hardest thing in the world. Why would you exclude one every five people that could potentially be your customer just because you want to write it in a tense that no one wants to read or, you know, that a percentage of people don't want to read. And there's no advantage to it. It doesn't bring anything. And again, going back to literally what I said earlier, 
it does not bring there is no difference between present tense and past tense when it comes to the engagement of the story no and and the, or, the weirdest part is the reverse is absolutely not true you do not find people who exclusively read in present tense right. <laughs> so exactly you gain nothing with present tense. well so i do want to I, I started stumbling on my words which means my brain was was literally screaming at me actually you're wrong <laughs> trick which is why i always do that so i have one story that is published in first person present tense and it actually enhances the story now first okay. of all it's a short story it's only about three thousand words thirty five hundred words long um but i've told this before it's this little kobold it was a story i wrote for sony so no one ever get to read it since that thing went belly up um I did have it posted on my website for a while. I may, and, and with the new websites, all that got taken down. So I just need to get that stuff to my people and get them to get it back up there. That's a really cool story. But I, but the character basically is like a three-year-old on crack. And he doesn't think about two seconds into the future. And he doesn't remember two seconds in the past. And so the the story screamed to be written in present tense because of the fact that the character was insane. He literally has no concept of time. He lives only in the now. And so because of that, it actually, because I did write it in past tense first. I wrote the whole story in past tense. And I was like, this isn't as good as it should. I feel like it should be. And then I just changed the tense. I rewrote it in, in present tense. I was like, wow, this is actually really good. This guy's crazy. Um, so, that's why I start stumbling because there there can be reasons to break these rules. I mean, to be fair, like in in my third book of Sangwheel, I actually do switch into present tense, um, as I showed you at one point where I have a character who experiences visions, mm -hmm. and I write those visions in italic and present tense to to separate them because you know that it brings that it brings a sense of like differentiation. Mm -hmm. So. It, it's not but that again, it never has a place. But that's a story reason that enhances the the impact mm. that it has on the reader. And yeah. that's what I mean. When you have that, it doesn't mean you're going to succeed with it. Um, yours, I think, was great. But I'm just saying, it's not just a carte bomb. Just because you think it's the right reason, and I'm using the proverbial you, just because you think it's the right reason, that's why you've got to use Drake's rule of 10. Get 10 people who don't give a crap about you, and at least eight of them need to agree that you've done a good job and then you've done a good job mm. um but yeah if, if you have a reason then you're more closely aligned uh because because pat had a reason i'm sorry rothless had a reason for um for why he did the first and third he did the first in his main character's pov and then he did the third anytime he was in the pov of any other characters it's it's actually what he what he did um because i was i recently reread it again in in the in the inn it's all in third person and then the innkeeper is telling the story. Right. And that's right. when it switches to first. Because it's, you know, the character telling right. a story of his past. Right. Which right. is the, the, the gimmick, the device. Right. But again, I don't feel like yeah. it it helped. I actually, so I also think Pat is a stronger first person writer than third person writer. I think he's a fine third person writer, but I think he's much stronger, which is... The biggest reason why that's so amazing to me is because I am weaker as a first person writer. I'm a much stronger third person writer. And so watching him in first person and being blown away by how great he is at first person. And then he comes into my third person domain where I am very strong in and go, ah, this is this is not as strong as it could have been if he had done this, if he had done that. Not that it's bad. It's it's fantastic. But it's it. I think he should have leaned into his strengths. So Jim, Jim Butcher. um has written a couple of not Dresden Files books, mm -hmm. uh, which he wrote in third person. And I actually feel the same way about that as you now talking about, about Patrick Rothfuss not being a strong third person. Um, he is a much stronger writer in first person yeah. than he is in third. And, um, and this has to do with time and grade. I write tons and tons and tons in third person. I mean, I write epic fantasy with multiple POVs. It's literally screams to be written in third person. I rarely write single POV stories. Um, and so, therefore, I have more experience writing in third person. And, and you know, plus all my teachings and everything else, I, I, I push toward that. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the thing when I was reading Name of the Wind, it's like, man, this guy is an amazing first person writer. And then you get in the third person. And I'm like, I mean, you know, it's it's fine. It's fine. You know, it's it's good. But but it's not amazing like the first person yeah. was. And so that also shows me a dichotomy between the two, the strengths of the two proses. So all of this comes down to just because you think you have a choice doesn't mean that it's actually the right choice is really where I was just trying to get to. Um, but if you don't have a reason, then you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So we have a couple of different things here again, just to kind of bring us back to this kind of an mm-hmm. omniscient that looks like it moves into more limited. We have a present a past tense and moves into present tense um, because then we're back into past tense in the very next yeah. line. You yeah. know, the court master stumbled. So yeah. we're only in present tense for this one little piece. Yeah. But there's a couple other things that I do want to talk about on this first paragraph, if, if we can. Yeah. So there's a lot of repetitiveness uh, in some of the word choices. And it's it, the first one, I think, was done on purpose. So the first one, which is the word eternal. Um, so knowing he was eternal, his name was eternal, his legacy was his eternal. And I think that was a, was on purpose. Yeah, right there for the um, for the cadence of it. The problem is I don't think the word works in cadence. I don't, I don't, I don't think this has a poetic cadence to it. Like, cause we've talked about this in, in previous podcasts where we, we actually look at lines that use repetitive words in a, in a cadence kind of pattern. This doesn't work for me as a cadence. I think this would work better if it was eternal and then a synonym for eternal and then a synonym for eternal like i think it would work better if it was three words that mean the same thing but three different words Mm -hmm. um and then the second one you even stumbled over uh because i don't think it was on purpose and that's face uh down in the second to the last line his mother's face even longer uh, her round smiling face because you hit that second one you were like i'm pretty sure i just read that word what's going on here yeah (laughs) so so that hurts this this one. And I, and I normally wouldn't pop talk about the face and face because it's like, whatever, um, that needs to be cleaned up in editing. But the reason why I want to talk about it is because I think the eternal was on purpose. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it has a good cadence kind of um, appeal to it, to my ear. And again, most of what we discuss in this is subjective. So someone mm-hmm. else maybe get listening is going, oh, I really like eternal, eternal, eternal. That's really good. But to my ear, it 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 read forced as opposed mm. to, you know, um, some of the examples that we've seen in the past. Uh, and yeah. you know, the, uh, the, it, the it's not it's not a word that has that rhythm to right. it. it. Like the, the shape of the word itself isn't quite right. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I can't and again, tell you exactly what a word needs to have the shape. I just like <laughs> it's it's that you know it when you hear it. Yeah, you know, that's that's really kind of the thing it is. And again, we are talking subjective here. Like like that's it. Like there's a good voice here. Um, I don't really have a lot of problems with the with the sentence structure or anything. I don't like the tense shift. I, I really hate the omniscient. The once upon a time makes me want to put a gun in my mouth. I um, I really like. I really think. Right. That if you said, if you did this, I told my mother that I wouldn't live to see 40. Like a true warrior, I would be cut down by a sword, you know, on the battlefield. Like, I really think that would read. Yeah. I 100% agree with you. Never disagree with you on that. Um, The one, the one other thing that I would say is this paragraph is too long. So, yeah. And this is chopped up. Yeah, this this is this might be a me thing, but I my eyes start glazing over at like sentence five ish of a paragraph. Yeah. I'm like too much. Like you know, find a way to break this up. And this is why when I'm teaching sentence structure and paragraph structure, I teach it, and it, and I've never heard anybody discuss it this way. But this is why my brain just works it. I teach it as these are bites of food, and mm. so. In a sentence, I'm shoveling words into my mouth. And when I get to the period, I swallow. And that's why sentence structure is so like last night's class or this month's class is show don't tell, which is kind of funny since my show don't tell book literally just dropped too. Um, and my classes are scheduled a year in advance. So it's not like I schedule it for this. 
But anyway, um, so there's this one example we're talking about filtering, and um, I think the the line is something like, um, "I see a knife laying on the table, and I pick it up." And so the filtering is this I see, which means if we diagram the sentence, I is our subject and C is the action. And there's nothing cool about I see. Everything else is is that. So to get rid of the filtering, you get rid of the I see. But but I use this as an example to also teach the the power of control in a sentence. So the rewrite is there's a knife laying on the table, period. I pick it up, period. And the reason why that is so important is because, again, Everything about writing is about controlling what the reader is experiencing at any given moment. So when I say there's a knife lying on the table, period, you swallow that piece of information, which means I'm going, hey, reader, there's a knife on the table. Do you see the knife? The knife is there. It's an important knife. See the knife? Pay attention to the knife because there's a knife there. Once you're done consuming that, hey, look at me. I'm picking up that knife. Me. Look at me. and Look at me picking up the knife that you just looked at. And so that's where it comes to even paragraph structure, because you're right. Not only am I swallowing bites with each sentence, but then also the paragraph is kind of the pl- the palate cleanser. So it's a it's, that's why it needs to be one group of information. And so you want to structure it in a way that that not only am I consuming these little bites of sentences and I'm you know seeing everything and not missing any details and everything like that, but then you you organize those into manageable paragraphs that I'm also consuming as a piece of information. And so that's why about halfway through this or about a third of the way through this, probably you're starting to get frustrated as a reader because that's that's understanding paragraph structure and understanding why we do things the way we do it. And I just don't think a lot of people think about sentence structure and paragraph structure in that light. And that's why I teach it in the, because it makes sense because then you're like, oh, I'm shoving all this stuff in their mouth and they can't swallow. A a lot of people like know that they shouldn't have too long sentences. And I, I don't see, I don't see overly long sentences often, but so few people. I do. I I know, but I mean, but I mean, you know, like, like people who've had any kind of critique, well, that's almost all the first thing anybody picks up, right? The sentence is too long, too convoluted, right. etc. Right. But not enough people pay attention to paragraph length. Like I agree. And it it is just so like it's so as as a reader, you're like, oh, is this thing not going to end? <laughs> Because again, you are looking at the spot where you consume that information that is in this paragraph, because the information in a paragraph needs to all relate. And so it's basically another bite of food. And so, you know, that's why I teach it with the bite, because everybody can understand, oh, I'm shoving a bunch of stuff in their mouth before I let them swallow it. Now they can't, not only can they not taste the individual words, they can't taste the individual sentences. So the flavors are all mixed together and it doesn't, you know, you're just mushing everything up. But also now I got to choke it down. I'm not swallowing it in this nice, comfortable, you know, way. And yeah, I love the way you're doing that. Uh, for those that aren't on YouTube, she's going through and kind of deciding without rewriting anything, just just chopping it up. But as an example, because uh, I do want to bring this up, um, we just hammered on the eternal not being a great rhythm. And yet she did do something that does help it. I still don't agree with the word, but now she's got a complete sentence by itself. He envisioned the moment when he would laugh in their faces, knowing he was eternal, new paragraph, his name, eternal, new paragraph, his legacy, eternal. And see by, because again, not only does a paragraph make me pause, I mean, a a period make me pause, but a new paragraph also stresses it. So when you have something like that, We've talked about this before on this podcast where I'll even do one word paragraphs because it literally makes the reader stop. If if that one word is in the middle of a paragraph, they'll gloss right over it as they're going, even though it's its own sentence. But when you break it out into its own paragraph, they have to, it, it's commanded that they will pay attention to it. The The only thing that leaps out more than a single word paragraph or like a short paragraph like this, like a three word paragraph, is if you put it in bold. And bold hurts the eye so much that you should never use it. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I'm glad you said that at the end because I was yeah. about to say, what? What are you talking about? No, no bold. Never use bold. Like, I'm not going to say absolutely never, but never use bold. <laughs> like, it I mean, is, yeah. It, it hurts. It hurts Everything the eye. can be broken if there's a right reason for it. But 
but yes, never usable. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I mean, you have to have a darn good reason. Um, You've really got to have a good reason because it, it literally really the does story <laughs> the story is broken if I don't bold this word. <laughs> so yeah, but yeah, so so yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I wasn't going to bring up that I wasn't going to go down that path, but um. But the paragraph is. structure is something I pay attention to because I feel like paragraphs are like scaffolding, mm-hmm. right? They shape the the outer edges of your story. They are the things that your your story hangs from. And if your scaffolding is poor, it doesn't matter how good your prose is. It gets lost in the the convoluted nature of your scaffolding. And I think that that's a real shame. I think it's a real shame that you didn't do your scaffolding well enough to showcase the excellence of your prose. Yeah. And that's, that's a, that's also a good way. Again, think about however you want to think about it. Like for me, I have a restaurant background. My family owned restaurants. I grew up in a restaurant. So a lot of things revolve around food for me. Um, so for me, it's like you're just muddling the taste. I'm not being able to taste any individual flavors because you shoved everything together. I like the scaffolding analogy as well. Um, so whatever works for your brain to help you understand that you're messing up, <laughs> use whatever analogy you want, because um, they all come down to the same thing. You're forcing the reader to try and consume too much information at one time, and you're muddying the waters. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, so that was the the opening paragraph, which we've now broken up into smaller paragraphs, and the uh, the author can take a look at that and see if they like it. Um, and then let's dive into this limited section. So we've just had the uh, the paragraph of his mother, and then then there's an italic sentence in the shade, and then we dive into dialogue. And I'm assuming that's kind of like a title or a scene break title or something. It looks like it, yeah. I'm I'm not entirely sure, but that's what it looks like. <laughs> um so in the shade. My my chancellor, I um the court master stumbled over his words like a lost man in a veteran's aid store. Spit it out, the old man said. Awkwardly seated on a small wooden chair, his eyes fixed on the window. Tell me what's on your mind. I don't have time for beating around the bush. In the garden, plants twisted in their blue, green, and red hues. The morning mist gently touched the wet leaves, and the scent of freshly cut grass wafted into the room. I'm going to just pause here and say there's two things that I'm not fond of here. There's, There's some that I like here and two things I'm not fond of. The first is we don't know anybody's name. Right. That's weird. Well, it actually takes a step back from that. Yeah. I don't know whose head I'm in. Yes. So I think it's even more egregious of a sin that, like, where's the camera? Who yeah. am I? That's the number one most important thing that you have to set up immediately because now I'm floundering. And then you are correct. It's exasperated by the fact that everybody is this because like the court master stumbled the old man said is the court master the old man are they the same person i mean there's not enough difference between the court master and the old man and since i have no idea where the camera is and i since i have no idea where i'm at yet and i'll i will give you a little time on the where am i at that needs Mm -hmm. to be done in the first couple of paragraphs and we Mm -hmm. start to get a little bit of it in that second paragraph there's there's a garden there's weird colored plants there's you know so we're getting a little bit of the setting of the scene but it is an egregious sin to not have the reader know whose head they're in because now they're just floating in nothingness and they're not connected to anything. So nothing matters because you don't know from whose perspective you're supposed to care about this information. And so in my opinion, writing limited in this way is worse than writing omniscient because at least with omniscient, you're grounded to this faceless guy who's telling you a story that's sitting next to you. That's not in the story, but with this, there's not even a faceless guy sitting next to me. It's mm. like, I just, I'm like, what, who, what, where I don't. Uh. And so that's the, the, but then you're right. It's exasperated by the fact that 
that not only that, we don't even get anybody's names. We don't know. And, and it's not the names that are important. It's the fact that the courtmaster could also be the old man. Now, yeah. obviously, it's not because one's stumbling over the words and the other one's saying spit it out. But it could be Gollum. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> I am. Um, spit it out. <laughs> like, you know, it could be the same guy with two personalities. Yeah. It's possible. We don't know. We haven't gotten far enough yet. So, also, yeah. Also, this spit it out and this tell me what's on your mind. These two things say exactly the same thing. Actually, I don't think they do. Like, my problem with them, and that's where I thought you were going to go, my problem with them is they are different moods. Okay. They have different tones. One is, spit it out. And the other is, tell me what's on your mind. Like, it's this much more calm, like, spit it out is a very aggressive mm. tone to have. And then it's this much more motherly, tell me what's on your mind. Come on, it's fine. So that's the problem that I had with it. I actually, and you're right, they both are saying the same thing. You're, I'm not disagreeing with you on that. But my problem with them is not that. It's not the redundancy. It's the tonal shift. So I from- think I think the long and the short of, of the difference between the two of us is there is no winning with these two. Because either somebody's going to read it like me in the same tone um, and say, but this is redundant. Right. Or somebody's going to read it like you and say, there's a tonal shift. Why is there a tonal right. shift? <laughs> you, you're because, not going to win with this. <laughs> right, right. Because if you take out the tell me what's on your mind, now the tone doesn't shift. Spit it out. I don't have time for beating around the bush. Yes. Like very aggressive and snappy. Um, yes. See, I just, I can't read, tell me what's on your mind in an <laughs> aggressive tone. It's too, it's too nice. It's no one's, no one's. When I was in the Marine Corps, no no drill instructor came up to me and went, tell me what's on your mind. Like, no, that's not it's not it's not very aggressive to me. So I'm not going to read it aggressive. Um, so, yeah, but you are right. It's also redundant. But that wasn't the issue that I had with it. That's not why it rubbed me wrong. Yeah. Um, then I do like that we get some scents here. I do like that we get, you know, some morning mist, wet leaves. There's there's some sensory description. All of that's good. But the problem is, since I don't know whose head I'm in, I don't know who's experiencing these colors mm-hmm. and experiencing this mist that's gently touching. I mean, first of all, it's gently touching wet leaves. So mm-hmm. am I the plant? Am mm-hmm. I in the plant's head? Like, because I'm feeling that. Like, I mean, I'm, 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 no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna call you, okay? Because, because, I mean, that, that to me is just like, um, pretty precious. Would, That's like saying I'm, the I'm sun's exagger- rays kiss the I'm, flower. You know, I'm exaggerating. <laughs> I'm exaggerating. I was picking. I obviously know we're not in the plants. <laughs> I'm just exaggerating the fact that we're not in a head, so I don't yeah. know who's experiencing this stuff. Yeah. And since the plant is the only thing experiencing something right now. Mm. Like it makes it, it's it's a great description if I was grounded in something. Yes. But since I'm not, yeah. it doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah. And Sorry. and that's that comes back to what we always say is like make the descriptions personal to the person experiencing the thing, which means that, you know, you need to ground the reader so that they right. know who's experiencing the thing. <laughs> right. Okay. So continuing onwards, uh, my chancellor, I'm afraid, I'm afraid it's not good. The master exhaled. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. This is not a speech deck. Right. Thank you very much. (laughs) The master exhaled does not tell me how the line was said. It is just an action. So I'm afraid it's not good does not end in in a comma. It ends in a period. And then the the is capitalized because it is its own sentence. Yep. Very good catch. Um. A short, unimpressive individual with sparse be- with okay. A short, unimpressive individual with sparse beard and even sparser hair. This sentence is not a sentence. Nope, it has no action. Yeah. A sentence to be a sentence must have a subject and an action. And by the way, um, we here in here in the states pronounce that sparse and sparser. Sparse. Okay. Um. I don't usually correct her English because she does speak like 20 <laughs> more languages than I do. And so I'm I'm the dumb one of this team when it comes to language. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, 
You need to be able to, and I say this all the time, to be a professional writer, you must be able to diagram every sentence you write. The cool thing is you don't need to diagram much. The biggest thing you need to understand is how to pull out your subject and your action so that you can look at this and go, a short, unimpressive individual with sparse hair and even sparser, or sparse beard and even sparser hair, it does what? What what are they doing? Where's the, what's what's the action? It's just a subject. See, so, if that if that the master exhaled, was attached to that sentence, you could make a, a sentence out of it. Right. Uh, yes. If you put a comma at the end of exhaled instead. Now, um, I wouldn't, the, the connector uh, of A to me is is mm. too jarring. It's too detached. So I'd be, yeah. um, it, it would be a the, and actually I would probably flip it around with the short haired, uh, unimpressive mm. individual with the sharp, with sparse beard and even sparser hair exhaled yeah so i put the action on the end if i was going to do that yeah. but yes you're 100 right you could can yeah. you could combine yeah. those up um and then you and then you can have a like a sentence out of that which right. is fun. right his right eye twitched in a tick yeah i think that's overriding yeah I, at this in a tick yeah his right eye twitched is enough i think yeah, or his his right eye ticked. Yeah, twitched um, or ticked or whatever, but it doesn't need to be twitched in a tick. They're basically the same thing. Yeah. Um, and and the reason why I'm calling this out is this is one of my sins. I I have a tendency to do this, like right. this exact thing. So so I notice it in other people's writing because I try and catch it in my own writing. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we talked about that a lot. Um, yeah, in magic pool. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, because you saw my very, very alpha drafts. So. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That was so, a lot of fun. I actually really liked that. Because <laughs> we wrote that so fast. You were literally just puking words as fast as you could. And then I was coming behind. And so, yeah, that was awesome. Saying like, I'm a whole person, not just a spine. <laughs> <laughs> so for context, um, Marie really loves spines. Like, Things move up spines, things move down spines, <laughs> spines contract, spines elongate. And so I eventually got in the habit where I just had a macro that I made that I would do a <laughs> comment and it would say, I am a human. I am not a spine. I am a human being. <laughs> Which is the whole, you know, hunchback kind of thing. I'm not an <laughs> animal. Um, yeah. Because, you know, we do have lots of different body parts that can have things <laughs> to it. Uh, she really loved the spine, and I yep. it just made me giggle. Um, um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I mean, I really did enjoy working <laughs> on that. I know we did it really, really fast, but it turned out really well. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, me too. But anyway, so I do notice that kind of overwriting um, because I do have a tendency to do it myself, which is why I caught yeah. it there. So uh, his right eye twitched, and his left hand rested heavily on the old man's shoulder. All right, let's let's stop there and talk about one of my pet peeves. It's very minor, uh -huh. um, but so because I write really immersive action is probably the reason why I'm so sensitive to this. Hmm. Um, so when you're in an actual fight scene, you have to be specific on a lot of things, especially rights and lefts, because you're defining the the you're painting the picture of this engaging fight. And so I'm very, very, very sensitive to to using descriptions like this. His left hand rested heavily on the old man's shoulders because my question is, does it matter? Does mm. it matter which hand is resting on the old man's shoulders for the reader? If they if I imagine that it's his right hand, is it going to change anything? Now, if the situation is he's then going to do something with his right hand that can only be done with his right hand. Then yes, I've got to say that we're going to do this with our left hand and this with our right hand, but I don't see that here. It's just, he's just reaching out and touching him and that's it. It's never mentioned again and no, nothing is else is ever mentioned again. So again, this is, this is very minor and very much personal to me because of the fact that I write so much fight scenes or so many fight scenes, but to me, the left hand it's just a waste of a word. It doesn't help the story. It doesn't, it doesn't, I, if I was to imagine his right hand on, on the shoulder, does it change anything for me as the reader? No. 
And so therefore I, I do try to, that's another part of, since we were just talking about overwriting, that is another thing that I push on the overwriting is don't describe mm -hmm. stuff that doesn't need to, need to be described. If it literally doesn't matter which way the reader imagines something, let, let, just let it go because you're just adding details that the reader now has to, to keep in mind when they don't need to. So the, the, the other thing for me on this sentence is I, that and doesn't work for me. Like the eye twitches and the left hand, what, what do these two things have to do with each other? Right. You know, it, it feels like there are two disconnected actions that are being connected because you felt like you needed to make the sentence longer. Like, I'm yeah, not saying I that's what, what you did. I'm saying that's what it feels like. So a better connector, although I will say that I wouldn't do it, mm. but a better connector, you're right, would be as. Mm. If right eye twitched as his hand rested on a shoulder. The mm. reason why I say don't is, again, this literally comes back to me writing so much action in my stuff. Yeah. Because in action, things tend to happen simultaneously, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I dodge just as the blade whip past my face, you know, or whatever, like they're happening at the same time. I am over sensitive to the word as everywhere else, because I go because like, it, let's say we wrote it this way, you know, mm -hmm. his right eye twitched as his hand rested on his shoulder. I would then when I'm in editing mode, because I have a macro that pops all my as is because again, I, I look at them. I go, wait a minute, do these have to happen at the same time? Does do they have to happen at the same time? No, his eye can just twitch and he can put his hand on his shoulder. And so I would cut it and I'd make it two different sentences. Had I wrote it, because I will write it again, I, as is one of my pet peeves, I are uh, uh, writer's ticks. I overuse the word as, and I know this, which is why I have a macro that finds all my ases when I'm in editing mode, because I know I overuse them. Like there'll be 30 ases on one page. Uh, everything's happening at the same time with me. Um, so I will absolutely in, in rough draft mode, I would absolutely write his eye twitch as he laid his hand on his shoulder. I 100% I'll write that guarantee. Mm -hmm. But then when I come back to it, I, I will always ask my every single time I hit an as I go, D do these have to happen at the same time? No, no, they don't. And I'll just cut it because it's stronger. A lot of people shy away from shorter sentences. And, you know, his right eye twitched. He placed his hand. And I want to talk about it heavily too, but let's just go with it for now. He placed his hand heavily on the old man's shoulders. It's so much stronger. And again, it goes back to that thing that I was talking about, the knife. Mm. His eye twitched. Look, his eye is twitching. You see that? Okay, now let's talk about something else. Now I want you to see he's placing his hand on his shoulders. We're we're almost we're it's it's about control. You know, I, I say this in my classes, and I've I've said it on this podcast before, but I'll say it here. In my opinion, the reader needs to bring nothing to the story. They are just the carnival attendant attendee they come in and they sit in my roller coaster they strap themselves in and then their responsibility is done they control nothing they do not get to control when the when the roller coaster goes up they do not get to control when it comes down they do not want to get to control when it goes into a loopy -loop, loop and so all of that is in my control i will make you laugh when i want you to laugh i will make you cry when i want you to cry i will make you afraid when i want you to be afraid i will make you fall in love when i want you to fall in love I will make you experience mind-numbing loss when I want you to experience mind-numbing loss. And how we do that is by understanding sentence structure and paragraph structure. And everything is about manipulation and control. Now it's manipulation and control in a good way. We're trying to we're trying to enhance their their pleasure through this journey, but it's still about control and manipulation. And so by using these shorter sentences in times of need, and again, longer sentence in times of need, it, it, it's all about. All of it is control, but by on purpose and by design, doing things the way that we talk about, um, that's where you start to really impact the reader in ways that they'll never notice. I mean, that's the other bad, the, the crappy thing about a lot of the high end stuff that I do in my writing now, no one will ever notice. No one. They will subconsciously. They'll be like, wow, this was a great ride. But they won't go, this is a great ride because he he used this short sentence here and then this longer sentence there. And he broke up this, you know, he used this cadence here. Like they won't ever think any of that. Mm. They will just know that they get at the end of that roller coaster ride and they're like, whoa, that was the best roller coaster ride I ever took. It was awesome. I'm getting in line again. Mm. Like that's and and that's how you do it. It's all about that. So yeah, don't don't be afraid of short sentences. His his right eye ticked. 
you know, is fine. You're right. They're they're not really connected actions. Um, did you want to say anything else? Because I do want to talk about heavily, just because it's there. Yeah. Uh, we can talk about heavily because I don't think heavily should be there. I don't think it yeah. serves any purpose. <laughs> Ly adverbs are always crappy, lazy writing. Always. They just are, they just are. There's no way to write in it now. Sometimes that doesn't mean cut every ly adverb out of your out of your manuscript. I have an ly adverb in pretty much every page. Sometimes I even have an ly adverb twice in a paragraph. Like sometimes the door just slowly closes and it's fine. But most of the time, like in this case, it's a missed opportunity to show the character. Again, we we don't know whose head we're in, so this can't happen until we know that. But if we knew whose head we were in and we knew where the camera was, this becomes an opportunity to show character because now it's what is the significance of this hand being heavily laid upon the shoulder? So if I am in the head of the person receiving it, then now I can expand upon what it means to me to have this guy heavily place his hand on my shoulder. If I'm the one doing it, I can do the scenario of that. And then if I'm just watching it, if I am still like, there's three people here maybe, and we don't know because we, we don't know who, whose head we're in. Um, there still is the significance of me watching this guy put his hand heavily. And then you, so you get rid of the word heavily and you replace it with whatever the significance is of this reason for the heavily placing the shoulder is it frustration is it um a fatherly you know whatever i mean there's there's we need to know the motivation and once you find the motivation behind it then that replaces the heavily and it, and it just immerses the reader deeper into this moment right now it's just he places his hand heavily on his shoulder okay great i don't care i don't there's no motivation behind it i don't know the reason there's no connectivity to it so great he heavily put his hand on his shoulder great awesome but when you have grounded the reader into the, the head and then you have the significance of it, now the reader understands. And, and this is what we talk about. That's the that elusive topic that we talk about, subtext. Yeah. Because now the heavily placed hand, because we use it in a way that describes its motivation, we also get subtext out of it. So we don't have to say, you know, he put his hand heavily on the man's shoulder and, and you know, frustration we can put that motivation in there remove the word heavily and they'll get that the guy's frustrated through subtext yeah so anyway. or or that he's doing it in sympathy or whatever the case is so right i, I think also like i'm i'm not afraid of using adverbs but i think that adverbs are too often used in an overly descriptive fashion. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't, nine times out of ten, you don't need the adverb. Well, that's the other way. So you're right. I should have said that. If there's no significance, if, like, what I just said to the author of this, and he's like, there's there's no reason why he's doing it heavily. He's just doing it. Mm -hmm. Then, yeah, you're right. He places, he, he, he rested his hand on the old man's shoulder. Like, if there's no motivation behind it, if there's no subtext that needs to be threaded through there because of the reason for this and the significance of this heavy handed thing, then, yeah, you cut it because it doesn't do anything. So, yeah, you're right. I didn't even think about I, I should have included both sides. You can yeah. cut it or if it actually matters, because, you know, for me, obviously, I don't use adverbs, you know, adverbs just willy nilly. So yeah. if I do it, it's because I'm actually just being lazy in my first draft mm. and the heavily does have a significance. And so when I'm doing my first draft, I'm not thinking about being a showy immersive writer. I'm just thinking about getting words on the page. And so I'll write heavily on his shoulder. And then when I come back around, cause again, one of my, my macros also pops every L Y adverb. And so I'll go through and be like, Oh, right. No, he puts it on because I have this in my mind when I was writing it, there is a significance to it. I just failed to convey that because I'm in first draft mode. I'm just in puke mode. And so the adverb is there because I puked it out and that's just the way it is. And so then I'll come back, but cause I don't write adverbs just willy nilly. Yeah. If there's no yeah. significance to it, I would, I would literally just write, he rested his hand on his, sh on his shoulder. Mm -hmm. Like, because there's no significance, so my brain would never think to put an L-Y adverb there. 
Okay. Um, I think we've actually. Should we finish this this bit of dialogue? Okay. So yeah, uh, he's right. He's let's right. See if we ever figure out whose head we're in. Okay. Uh, his right eye twitched and his left hand rested heavily on the old man's shoulder. Chancellor, it's good that you came. In, that you came. Maybe we can't do much, but we can ease the pain. Unfortunately, I was right. He looked the old man straight in the eyes, then turned to a nearby sideboard. He rummaged through worn out wooden boxes, took out a vial of silvery liquid and handed it to the Chancellor. Yellow fever? The master didn't answer, nor did he meet his gaze. Ben, we've known each other for too long. I know I knew something wasn't right as soon as you got me up so early to come here, the Chancellor said as he took the vial. It was indeed early. The city bell hadn't struck six yet, although the sun already embarked on its journey of the day. Somewhere below, beneath Ben's chambers, the waves of sweet water still played with anchored boats, and port workers rolled heavy barrels filled with wine, honey, and spices. As a child, he used to curse the old man, the old men and their early rising, firmly deciding that he would sleep until noon at their age. Though now he had reached those years, he would soon sleep forever. All right. So yes. here we find out we finally know that we're in the Chancellor's head. Yeah. Because we get to the, as a child, he used to curse, at least I think. No, that. I don't think we're in the Chancellor's head. I think we're in the... I think we're in the court master's head. I think the chancellor is the old man. Look here. He, he rested on the old man, and then he calls him chancellor. Okay, right. So the old yeah, man right, is the right. chancellor. All right. Then the then the chancellor, I think, is speaking here. Where Yeah, the chancellor is speaking here where he says Ben. So Ben is the court master. We're in the court master's head. Okay. So why yeah, didn't we know that up here? <laughs> yeah. Well, and see, look at how we're still struggling with it, even though the words are all here. And it's like, we're yeah. still like, okay, yeah, no, I think we are. You're, I think you're right. Because I actually lost, I lost the plot in here. I yeah. lost who was talking between the two. Yeah. Uh, when you were reading, I had to go back. I actually didn't get to read the last part of it that you were reading because I had to go back and reread because I had lost the thread of who is saying what to who. Uh, and again, that comes back to what you were talking about, about we didn't name anybody. We didn't, we, you know, we have the court master and the old man. And, and then here, also have the chancellor. Yes. Now here, I want to say something that this author might believe because they might have been told this. Okay. Because I have had somebody tell me this in critiquing my work. The words that was written on the page that I disregarded immediately once I read them was in third person. You cannot show what is inside anybody ever. You can only do that in first person. I was like, you know, I thank you for your opinion. I don't agree. Move yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. So um, we've talked about this before. Uh, I literally talked about it last night since I did my show. Don't tell class. Um X, and so there is a group of writers that are professional writers that I hang with that believe this. Um, they actually, I think I've told the story of before where one of them had critiqued me and said, wow, you're very, very telly and you need to be more showy. And I asked him what he meant by that. And he was like, well, you're telly because you're, you're telling me what's going on inside of the character. And I'm like, that is not telling. You've got the wrong definition. I mean, I didn't have this discussion with him. I just thanked him. But um, exposition is what separates prose from all other mediums. Being inside, and that is literally the definition of a limited POV, a limited POV, not first person or third person. The being inside of your narrating character is not a first person thing. It is a limited thing. First person is a limited POV. So therefore, we are limited by the narrator that we're inside. But third person limited, or in reality, third person free indirect discourse is a limited POV meaning you are inside the narrator of the story. So therefore, if you're going to write in limited, which you should, I mean, it is what people expect now. It's why third person is, is starting to, to shine more and more as the decades have been going on, because we have gotten that, oh yeah, it's a limited POV. So yes. Uh, uh, and right. I was just thinking, I was thinking this because 
we only encounter character names once it's been said in dialogue. Right. And I've encountered this as well with some people when they critique me. They're like, oh, you can't just say the character's name. You can only say the character's name once it's been said in dialogue. I'm like, um, thank you for your critique. Yeah. It's regarding that piece of advice. You know, the funny <laughs> thing is, is no one has ever said that to me. And I, if, if the first two words are not the character's first full name, because I always use first and last name at the opening of almost every chapter, um, they will be within that first sentence or, you know, whatever, unless there's some reason why I'm hiding it from the reader. But like almost every our dairy chapter starts with our dairy core, blah, 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 blah. And the next chapter will be Clytus really and blah, 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 blah. Or like, my realm guys didn't like that I did this. So in the, because that is my writing style. So since I don't write very much single POV, this is a single POV story. There's, I think 11 chapters or 12 chapters in here and it's only Latimus. And so it starts off, you know, chapter one is Latimus feed stood holding the horse's reins. Chapter two is, and I don't know, I haven't looked at this, but, Let's just see. Chapter two is, uh, well, there's a whole paragraph because I'm tying into the last chapter. But in the second paragraph, the night passed better than Latimus Athede had expected. And then in the third chapter, the rest of Latimus Athede's morning (laughs) passed. I mean, and I never use Athede other than that. I only use it at the beginning of every chapter. But again, I write multi POV characters. So it's not as... I do get, and I actually did almost bend, like when my other realm writers were like, you don't need to keep saying a feed. I I almost took it out. I almost was like, you know what? You're right. I don't write a lot of third person single POV. So maybe I should. And then I was like, you know what? But that's my writing style. I've literally been doing it this way for 30 years. Everyone who reads me knows that I do this. If it offends somebody, okay, I'll take that hit, but I'm going to leave it in there. I mean, if you get offended by the fact that I wrote, you know, Latimus a feed at the beginning of 11 chapters, then you're pretty petty, in my opinion. So um, in, in Magic Fall, I did it for the first introductory chapter in both cases. I used name right. and surname. But following on from there, I just used their names throughout. Right, uh, right. And I was fine with that, too. Yeah. Um, but, but that's just the, that's just the me. Like, it, I, I, I also, like, <laughs> with Louis, you don't learn his surname until, I don't know, the end of the book, just about. <laughs> yeah. Well. So it, it depends. Yeah. So in Genesis, um, the first chapter opens up with the beast. Yeah. And then you actually only get the beast for um, probably his first four or five chapters. And then he learns his name. Yeah. His name is actually Clean Canaan. And so that's when his chapter starts start starting with Clean Canaan. But only after he learns his name, because he didn't even know his name. He, you know, somebody with magic and blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's all of that. So. But right. yeah, so oh. so it, it depends. But yeah, so I I do not subscribe to the you can't tell people's names yeah. before dialogue. That is, it is no, don't don't believe people. Don't believe people when they say that. I do not subscribe to the you cannot give internal emotions. You are literally writing in a limited POV. Use it. <laughs> so to get back to this, I think that the the biggest problem that I have with this piece is that we don't we don't settle into the POV's head. And I personally, I think this would be best written in first person. That's my opinion. <laughs> also, my eyes just accidentally skipped down. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm not sure where in Ben's head. Because if you look at that last paragraph on the screen... Wheezing. Yeah. John hated wheezing as a child too. Yep. We are in John's head in that line. But I also so know why we are we in Ben's head, head here? Yeah, right. we've got head hopping. So, um, and we've—I think we've exhausted talking about head hopping and why it's bad and why it destroys the story and doesn't help anything for immersion and readership and everything else. But my my literally. I know we're not going to read anymore because we've already kind of gone to time with this yep. podcast, but my eyes just drifted down there and it, I saw that and I was like, Oh, unless you didn't change that name. That is, I know that could have. So I guess there is a, 
possibility. No, I changed. I changed both names. They were other names. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, so anyway, yeah, uh, the piece needs some work, but mostly it's been uh, foundational stuff, um, mm -hmm. rounding in the the POV's head, making sure we understand what POV we're going to use and why we're going to use it. Um, the, the the writing is is good. Mm. Like the voice solid. is strong. Like I really do feel really the voice good. is strong. That's why I vote for first person because that's what you need for first person. You need that strong voice. A hundred percent. The only problem is, is if this is a multi POV story, you can't write that in first person. You'll break Correct. it. Uh, Correct. I mean, you can, but again, you're ruining your whole vehicle thing that we have already discussed. So if it is multiple POVs, then third person is your baby. Yep. Um, but you need to tighten that up and you need to stay in one head in every scene. So if we're in Ben's head in this scene, then we're in Ben's head in this scene. And John is a secondary character. And in the next scene, if we're in John's head, then Ben becomes a secondary character. Yep. And if you can, it is very difficult, but if you can try to use a little bit different voice for John than you use for Ben, yeah. um, because it does enhance the read. It does. So, yeah, I mean, some good stuff in here. Some really good stuff in here. Um, but I definitely, really, I, 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 this this opening paragraph, in my opinion, would read fantastic, like in first person. <laughs> like it's it's one of those opening paragraphs that you can just feel in first person. You know, which is funny because it's the type of first person opening that you don't like that I do like. It, it's not that I don't like it. I do like it sometimes because I mean, Jacqueline Carey starts like that and she's, right. she's like run away. My favorite first person author. Um, she's also at Comic-Con just on a side note. No. <laughs> I saw the notification the other day. Um, but um, you'll have to break away and go. I, I'm, I'm going to have to, you know, <laughs> um, but, but it's, um, it, it's not like you can't start like this. You know, and this is a good way to start with first person, but it is a first person omniscient start. And it's right. as we discussed, it's a stylistic difference, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. I think that is that for this one. And uh we will see you soon for another one. Bye.